Welcome to day two of the Haas Symposium hosted by Canterbury Museum. Today, we are privileged to be able to bring to you the work of six Viennese contributors presented in four papers. We will be hearing about Julius von Haas networking through European learned societies, or what the author describes as scientific diplomatic strategies. We will then be hearing about Haas' ambitious undertaking to make Canterbury and New Zealand shine on the world stage by driving the, initi the initiative to hold the Interprovincial and Vienna Exhibition in Christchurch in 1872, from which a selection was then shipped to Vienna for the 1873 World Fair. And the final paper in this, in this session will shed new light on how Haast was elevated to European nobility by the Austrian Emperor, giving him the title Fon. Later on, in the second session, chaired by Dr. Paul Schofield, we will then present the much-anticipated paper on the Viennese Moa, held in the collections of the Natural History Museum in Vienna. And the final paper of the conference will take a closer look at the correspondence of Sir Julius von Haast. Again, before I introduce our first speaker, I'd like to encourage you all to send in your questions, either via chat function in Vimeo or by email to haast200 at canterburymuseum.com. It is now my great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Johannes Mattis of the Viennese Academy of Science, joining us this morning from his hotel in India. Dr. Mattis is research project leader at the Institute of Culture, Studies and Theatre History of the Austrian Academy of Sciences. He was visiting professor at the School of Advanced Studies in Social Sciences in Paris, visiting scholar at Stanford University and York University in Toronto, and is associated to the Center for Science Studies and of the German National Academy of Sciences, Leopoldina. In 2021, he was awarded the Bader Prize for the History of Natural Sciences. Dr. Mattis is board member of the International Commission on the History of the Geological Sciences and the History of Earth Sciences Society in the United States of America. Dr. Mattis will be sharing with us some of the results from his research into the networking functions of European scientific and learned societies and how Julius von Haast used his connections and considerable scientific diplomatic skills to build his international reputation and further the aims of Canterbury Museum. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Johannes Mattis. Thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, kind introduction. It's really great to be with you today, at least virtually. First of all, let me thank all organizers to make this conference happen and how great this event was prepared. Especially, I would like to greet Mike Johnson and thank Sasha Nolten for his support he has all done for me in the last month. I would like to start right away with a quotation of Hochstetter published in the Journal of the Geographical Society in Vienna in 1866. This was about eight years after Haast had first set foot on the soil of the Crown Colony of New Zealand. At that time, the unity and the self-government of the colony granted in 1852 was being consolidated by the relocation of the seat of Parliament from Auckland to Wellington. Likewise, past careers had gained traction and he was about to be elected a fellow of the London Royal Society. Hochstetter wrote, repeatedly I had the opportunity to report in the meetings of the Geographical Society and the research of my tireless friend in New Zealand, Dr. Julius Haast. Through his expeditions, geographic order gradually enters the mountain chaos. I can only approve that Haas has followed the custom of English and American colleagues who, wherever they plant a flag in foreign countries, immortalize the names of their compatriots in the geography of the country." Unquote. Haas was not only present in Europe through his friends and membership in scientific society, but he symbolically represented them overseas 
inscribing the scholar relationship with the old world into the geography of the colony through English, German, and French place names. Even this unfortunately means replacing Maori names Hochstetter added. Quote, my demands are not high. I'm 25 years old and have a healthy, strong body. If I do reasonably well in the country, I may stay there forever, unquote, wrote the German zoologist Wilhelm Harke to Haas in 1880. Young naturalists who set out on overseas trips from the imperial centers had career goals in mind. The expertise, scholarly networks, and evidence gathered for their own publications or those of their mentors were considered door openers for academic employment and recognition in their home countries. Haas was only one of several German-speaking researchers, such as the zoologist Robert von Lendenfeld or the taxidermist Andreas Reischek, who went to New Zealand. But Haas ended up staying overseas for most of his life and was perhaps more successful than he could ever have been in Germany. Life as a naturalist overseas was based on different expectations, goals and career strategies. Researchers like Haas settled down and participated in the funding of local scientific institutions often on the basis of experience they had brought with them. But they also sought to act as multi-loyal intermediaries for scholars from imperial centers using shipments, shipments of natural specimens, correspondence, publications, and the membership in scientific societies as resources to advance the projects. Scientific societies were significant playbills in the booming world of 19th century associations. Bringing together professionals, practitioners, and sponsors, these societies saw themselves primarily as communication hubs. They built up enormous collections, initiated expeditions, and offered support for managing inner imperial diversity. Publication series and regular meetings gave them a stable identity and structure. While scientific societies initially played a major role in nationalizing the research landscape in Rio from the 1870s onwards, they became driving forces for establishing new forms of internationalism and cross-border collaboration. However, as the illustration on the left shows, there was no single model for a scientific society. Major differences between societies existed in their exclusivity the source of funding, popularity, and the location of members. While societies and period centers were often divided in scientific disciplines, those in the provinces were characterized by a high degree of interdisciplinarity and institutional hybridity, sometimes combining the tasks of a learned society, a museum, or an institution of higher learning. Scientific societies based in European metropolises were often closely linked to the state administration and its imperial goals. The territorial distribution of the members between centre and periphery resembled isothermal zones of influence, characterised by a consensus on shared bodies of knowledge and culture. While empires relied on a variety of scientific, spatial, social and administrative knowledge gathered surveyed and exchanged by learned societies. These in turn gained prestige and funding by fulfilling imperial tasks and became the general embodiments of statehood and territoriality. But imperialism is not a one-size-fits-all piece of clothing. There is nothing to sugarcoat, but we also need to differentiate and contextualize. While, for example, trade and military interests were prominent in the British Empire, Initiatives and profit sharing by private beneficiaries played a major role in the German Empire. In the Habsburg monarchy, territorial, expansive, and civilizing integrative claims were interwoven. Attempts of indirect colonization often served both economic and scientific needs. In these imperial contexts, Haas operated and sought to succeed in the competitive scholarly environment in New Zealand and Europe.
less research is the role of corresponding members in imperial scientific societies. These initially included scholars from the provinces. Later, with the expansion of the colonial empires, they were joined by loyal researchers from overseas. In my following presentation, I will use the example of Haas to show that relations between scholars from the centers and from overseas were both based not only on communication and knowledge exchange, but also on mutual benefit. Such individual collaborations often within the framework of scientific societies already existed before a new form of internationalism was established around 1880 with the emergence of international scientific organizations and a vibrant Congress culture. I will examine the cross-continental cooperation of Haas and scientific societies in Europe on three levels. First, the network of societies to which Haas sought connection, the store openers and the goals of membership. Second, how the societies, but also Haas, personally benefited from it. And third, the mediating role of scientists working from overseas. For this purpose, I have studied the journals of scientific societies, the existing secondary li uh, literature and correspondence changed between scientific societies and Haast. So let's start right away with the network of societies. Even after a long search, I have found no, I have not found any inter uh, indication that Haas was a member of a popular scientific society in Europe before its arrival in New Zealand. At the beginning, therefore, Haas uh, was Haas's admission to the Karka Geographical Society and the Karka Zoological Botanical Society in Vienna in 1861. Both associations had been founded a few years earlier as inclusive statewide associations and in opposition to the exclusive Vienna Academy of Sciences. The Geographical and the Zoological Botanical Society had hundreds of members, such as museum curators, state officials, collectors, and teachers, with about 30% coming from foreign countries. Oh, sorry, it was too fast. Uh, from foreign countries, but only 3% from territories from the British Empire. The Nomara travelers, Hochstetter, Georg von Frauenfeld, who headed this, uh, the societies as president and secretary, proved to be door openers for Haast, and thanks to his reports and specimens sent, enforced his membership prepared correspondence. Haast also owed his admission to the German Academy, Leopoldina, to the community of earth sciences in Vienna. The director of the Imperial Geological Survey, Wilhelm von Heidinger, held an influential position within the Leopoldina, and there he successfully pushed through some of his reform program, which had previously had been rejected by the Vienna Academy. To reinforce his position, Heidinger proposed as members, mainly loyal naturalists who had been refused or had no chance of admission at the Vienna Academy including Frauenfeld and Haast. Together with the letter of thanks, Haast sent his CV and a portrait photograph to the Leopoldina. He immediately took the opportunity to negotiate with its president, Karl Karos, about a possible publication of his reports in the Academy's periodicals and an extension of the collection of the Lubina by objects from New Zealand. Finally, Carlos even got a mountain in New Zealand named after him. Haas's membership in Venice societies and the Leopoldina served as a springboard to gain admission to the more exclusive London societies, which were certainly more significant for Haas's ambitions in the Crown Colony. To get his food in the door, Haas used similar strategies. Frequently, he addressed his letters, which involved reports of his travels, booklets, of his Nelson exploration, uh, or offers of exchange directly to influential members 
or even the society's presidents. By 1864, um, Haast felt ready uh, to be elected a fellow of the London Royal Society and gained the influential Josef Hooker as his advocate. The later wrote to Haast, quote, I went to Sir Roderick Murchison and found him quite favorable. I then went to Professor Ramsey, who hardly promised to have your certificate prepared signed and presented next year. I need not say that I will do all I can for you, but the strength of your claim must be geological, to be vouched for the practical geologist, um, unquote. Ultimately, it would be uh, uh, two years before Haast was actually elected. So, sorry, this was the, the quotation. So, Haas' admission to scientific societies beginning in the 1870s were primarily aimed at gaining academic recognition in his former home country, Germany. Most of these later memberships were either hard currency in exchange for scientific data and sources or honors for Haas' lifelong service to science. To sum up this section, Haas used inclusive scientific societies primarily as a communicative resource, while memberships in exclusive societies promised prestige and enabled social climbing. Close friends in Europe served as a door opener for Haas, and his extensive use of correspondence as a form of scholarly diplomacy made him a trustworthy partner to several institutions at once. The learned societies in Europe uh, centers may have served as a model for Haas initiatives to found own scientific associations in New Zealand. For example, when the Philosophical Institute of Canterbury was established, Haas was in close correspondence with Hooker, who gave him detailed advice on the management of the society, quote, not have a museum, our London Geological Society is now crushed down by its museum, and our Linnaean Society was a death store for many years. When evil days come on a society, its member lived like Rebets, a sinking ship, unquote. So, Let's move now to uh, the strategies of mutual benefit. Scientific societies benefited in several ways from naturalists working from overseas. As local experts, they provided scientific evidence of data and objects discovered abroad. They embodied the imperial diversity of European societies and were considered the local representatives on site, and they maintained the continuous inflow of objects from imperial collections. The acquisition was essential for keeping pay, uh, pace and the stiff international scramble with these prestigious specimens. In 1880, for example, the Senckenberg Natural History Society acknowledged the receipt of a collection from Haast, quote, the shipment, consisting of 60 exemplars of New Zealand birds, skeletons, and plants, has far exceeded our expectations in richness and rarity. Unquote. Likewise, Haas took advantage of the resources provided the imperial societies. In addition to the aforementioned prestige in the society's role as communicative hubs, Haas received financial support for his ventures help in pushing his objects through, uh, projects through and in the public dissemination of his research findings. Likewise, European scientific institutions sent stocks of natural specimens to New Zealand to complete the collections there or to introduce non-native species to so-called acclimation societies. In the years Haas joined the Kaka Geographical Society in Vienna, their association transformed the traditional model of corresponding members gradually into a system of proactive agents spread over southeastern Europe. 
as partly mobile informants, they conducted collecting activities on site, prepared expeditions, or as participants promised the higher success of the undertakings with their local knowledge and language skills. Although Haas never belonged to this Orient, Oriental Commission, he was certainly more than a simple corresponding member for most European societies. He participated in large-scale joint projects, such as international expeditions, sending samples and reports abroad that were revised and disseminated by others. Thus, his cooperation with European colleagues shows preliminary forms of cross-continental division of labor. For scientific societies, the involvement of naturalists from overseas not only served to create a loyal education class in the peripheries of the empire, but became a means of scholarly acculturation to how science was practiced in the imperial centers. Unifying identification offers were in the foreground. These included the use of English, French, or German as a language of science, the consensus and the integrity of the state, the legitimacy of its government, and its political cultural claim to supremacy on a par with other European empires. Scholarly acculturation, however, can be also observed at the epistemic level. On integration of naturalists working from overseas forces the emergence of thought collectives based on a common reference to the same bodies of knowledge and culture, for example, theories, terminology, methods, and handbooks. Much of this applies to Haas' relationship with European scientific societies. In his case, it was not a university education in Vienna or London, but the personal training by Hochstetter and the time spent together in New Zealand that provided, able, uh, that provided a durable common framework. So he did not hesitate to act as local informant, gradually pull the strings to establish political and scientific context and promoted a context and promoted the emigration of German speaking naturalists to New Zealand. So let's move now to the final point to make the mediating role of naturalists work in overseas. Expensive expeditions dispatched from the imperial centers were only one form of knowledge acquisition. Naturalists working from overseas with language skills and access to various networks of knowledge played a decisive role in knowledge acquisition. They often took on intermediary roles, acted as brokers and enablers of public-private partnerships that straddled various levels of imperial polity. This is especially true of Haast, who in addition to his scientific activities was appointed German consul in 1880. Through his German origin, Haas was advantaged in his relations with the Maori and could travel to otherwise mixed several territories in the 1860s. Thanks to his on-site expertise and access to field sites and sources, Haas balanced the inability to participate in decision-making processes and meetings in Europe. So, in my conclusion, I would like to give you two take-home messages. First, would Haas's career have been possible without his European networks? Maybe, but it would certainly have been different. The rise from a barely successful German dropout to a highly decorated scientist is hardly thinkable without his imperial settings and Haas's mutual relationship to the European scientific landscape. And second, can Haas' biography serve as a model for a better understanding of other naturalists working overseas in the 19th century? I think so, yes. Certainly, the success and the persistence with which Haas pursued his career is probably unique. But the framework, strategies, and empiric context in which his research was embedded probably resembled those of other European naturalists working in the Southern Hemisphere. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Mattis. 
What a fascinating insight you have given us into the workings of 19th century science networks. And a special thank you for highlighting the value of correspondence as primary source evidence in your, in your research. That's absolutely wonderful. Thank you for joining us from India. All the best for your remaining travels. Thank you. Thank you.